Hello, everyone. My name is Micah Utrecht. I'm deputy editor of Jacobin. Thanks for tuning in to our series, Stay at Home. You're probably familiar with the drill by now, but uh, since the coronavirus pandemic, we've been doing these uh, multiple times weekly, two, three times, four times weekly uh, discussions, uh, usually consisting of a lecture on a given political topic and then some discussion with the author afterwards. That is what we're going to be doing today. So we'll give people a couple minutes to stream in here while we're waiting. If you could be so kind as to like this video, uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, why wouldn't you do that when we're providing you with such a plethora of these videos uh, multiple times every week? Uh, before I get to today's video, I want to mention what we have on deck for Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we will be having a discussion on Corbynism and its legacy, what's its historic legacy, where does the labor left go uh, after Jeremy Corbyn, what did Corbyn accomplish within the Labor Party. Uh, that'll be 6 p.m. on Friday uh, with uh, Grace Blakely, David Broder, John Baptiste Adore, and hosted by Dustin Guastella. So please tune in for that. And today uh, we are joined by Alex Vitali uh, to discuss uh, the topic that is on everyone's minds right now, which is the incredible upsurge rebellion that we're seeing in the streets in the wake of the police murder of George Floyd. It's a time when uh, everybody should be out in the streets, of course, uh, but everyone should also be, uh, you know, engaging with thinkers like Alex, who were talking about uh, not just, uh, you know, the, the how we should be in the streets and making uh, our, our rage known at this uh, yet another uh, absolutely unjustifiable police killing of an unarmed black man, uh, but also what the uh, bigger picture demands of this movement uh, should be, which is what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, Alex Vitale is a professor of sociology at the City University of New York. Uh, he's also the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College, and he is the author of the book, The End of Policing, uh, which is available from Verso, and I believe right now is available for free download uh, from Verso uh, at versobooks.com. Uh, so make sure you go there and check out that excellent book. Uh, also, you know, that book has gotten a lot of attention uh, lately, uh, Alex, but, you know, the real Alex Vitale heads have the city of disorder. <laughs> If you, if you know about this, you, you have, uh, you know, that's a, a deeper cut in the, in the Vitaly archive. Um, and Alex has been all over lately uh, writing about uh, policing uh, issues and specifically about the need to defund the police, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, just today, he did an interview with uh, Jacobin's own Megan Day uh, about this very question. The best way to reform the police is to defund the police. So... As per usual, we're going to be uh, hearing from Alex uh, for a bit on his own. Uh, and uh, if you're watching live on YouTube or Facebook, please uh, write in the chat uh, your questions for Alex. Uh, and after he uh, has a, a bit of time uh, giving his presentation, we'll go to those questions. And once again, please do remember to hit like and subscribe and also uh, share the stream on your own social media feed so that we can get this uh, this discussion in front of as many people as possible. So, uh, Alex, thanks for taking the time and you can take it away. Great, well, thanks so much for, for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be, uh, you know, doing this in partnership with Jacobin, which has been a kind of home for some of my thinking about this stuff over the last several years. And uh, just maybe take a second to orient people to how we might want to understand this, this moment, at least in relationship to the questions around policing, because I think it's clear that what's going on right now is about more than just policing. So Minneapolis was actually held up as a kind of shining star of police reform. After the police murders of, of Mike Brown and, and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and so many others, we were told by the Obama administration, by local mayors and police chiefs, don't worry. We, we see there's a problem, but we're going to fix it. we got a set of reforms that are going to make it all better. We're going to give the police implicit bias training, de-escalation training, mindfulness training. 
We're going to hold a series of police community encounter sessions where we're going to talk about racism and apologize for past wrongdoings. And maybe at the end, we'll all take a knee together. We're going to give everybody body cameras. We're going to create some early warning systems to identify those bad apples so we can weed them out. And, and then the public will have more trust in the police so the police can get back to go doing the important work that they need to do. And basically, what I just said is almost exactly what President Obama just said moments ago uh, across the country in his town hall that we need to go back to those reforms of five years ago because we, we didn't quite do enough of it. We need to get more buy-in. We need to have more police community encounter sessions and that will fix policing. But Minneapolis did it all. They actually wrote a report in 2018 detailing all the fantastic procedural reforms that they had adopted, the whole menu from the Obama Task Force on 21st Century Policing, which is the kind of highest expression of what we call procedural justice. And what all these reforms share is this idea that the problems of policing are problems of professionalism and individual level bias and maybe a lack of transparency and, and formal accountability systems. And that if we just fix those things, then policing can go back to its normal function of preserving law and order. But what these procedural reforms fail to account for is the fact that the problems are in what the police is, are doing, not how they are doing it. Part of the reason we make this mistake, right, is that we, we've been driven by these handful and growing number of really horrific individual incidents of extreme police violence and death, of murder. But the problems of policing are about so much more than that. It's about a broad problem of over-policing. And over the last five years, as all these reforms have been implemented, there has been no change to that problem of over-policing. And there hasn't even been any reduction in the overall levels of police violence and killings. We really have almost nothing to show for the tens of millions of dollars we pumped into the budgets of American police to fix policing. And I think the anger we see on the streets in Minneapolis and across the country is at least in part an expression of that frustration about the fact that we were sold a bill of goods. That these mayors trotted out these reforms to placate our movements so that we would go to sleep and they could go back to waging a war on drugs and a war on gangs and a war on crime and a war on immigrants and a war on terror, as they always have. To flood our schools with police, to turn drugs into a criminal justice issue, to drive the homeless and those with mental health challenges into the jails. This is not a solution to our society's problem. It's a way of papering over them, of trying to build legitimacy for a system that is producing mass homelessness, producing mass untreated mental illness, producing mass drug death. It's time that we quit trying to make police friendlier, nicer, more law-abiding. We don't need to give narcotics officers anti-bias training to deal with the racism in the war on drugs. We need to end the war on drugs. But our political leaders, they're not willing to take that on. They continue to use criminalization to allow them to continue this kind of austerity politics in which government resources are used to push wealth up the ladder to subsidize the already most successful parts of the economy in hopes that the results will magically trickle down to the rest of us. Woo! Well, I've been a, a public employee in a union 
of the state of New York for 20 years now, and I haven't seen any trickle down yet. And I don't think anyone else out there watching this broadcast has either. And I think that's part of the frustration we see today. So what do we do instead? Well, we have to rethink the way in which we've turned every social problem into a problem for the police to solve. How we've used criminalization as an alternative to having a decent social welfare system, a safety net, and a set of economic opportunities for people that are distributed more evenly. So how do we get them out of this mess? We've got to take away their toys, take away their units, take away their overtime, and reduce the headcount of policing. Ideally, in a very targeted way, where we eliminate specific functions like school policing and redistribute those resources into things that will actually make schools better learning environments for our children. We don't, in New York City, we have 5,000 NYPD personnel in city schools, more than all counselors, social workers combined. We don't need that. What we need is more counselors, more social workers, more teacher's aides, more high quality extracurricular activities. And we need to rethink the whole reliance on zero tolerance discipline systems that are driven by high stakes testing regimes where everyone is doing rote learning by the book. We need to enliven the experience for children and we need to involve them in the production of a safe school environment instead of excluding them and criminalizing them. So the defund movement that we see taking off across the country is an expression of a lot of these ideas that have been percolating all across the country for a number of years now. The work I do is really just to try to give some voice to this. I, I have the privilege of being able to do some long form writing and research and to get a certain kind of voice out into the public conversation. But I consider myself part of a movement of organizations on the ground in cities across the country who've been pushing back against this program of mass criminalization, who've been saying, we don't need another jail. We need youth, youth centers. We don't need school police. We don't need the police to be in charge of mental health services. We need actual mental health services. So my hope is that what's happening today across the country will help feed those movements and build their power. Because I think any movement to create economic and racial justice in the United States has to involve dialing back the power of the carceral apparatus, which is going to be used against us and our movements. So I wanna just end with a short clip of video from New York that we produced at the Policing and Social Justice Project. As part of our contribution to the campaign in New York to defund the NYPD, we're calling for a billion dollar reduction in the NYPD budget over the next several years. And really that's just a drop in the bucket. So let's take a look at the video and then we can talk some more about these ideas. Nationwide protests over the death of George Floyd have led to increasingly more calls to defund police departments. And New York is no exception. With over 360,000 cases confirmed and over 28,000 COVID-related deaths, New York City remains the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the U.S. So, to cover the estimated $10 billion tax revenue shortfall from self-quarantine, local officials are proposing dramatic cuts to the city's budget. But activists, educators, and community groups alike are taking issue with the budget proposed by Mayor Bill de Blasio. That's because in the midst of the budget's deep cuts to social services, education, and youth programs, the NYPD's yearly budget has been left nearly intact. Even without the millions of dollars spent on settlement cases for police brutality victims, New York gives nearly $6 billion to the NYPD each year. That's billion with a B. According to the United Nations, that makes NYPD's budget higher than Greenland's entire GDP and over 50 other countries around the world. So, how did we get here? Well, under Mayor Bill de Blasio and the City Council, NYPD's budget grew from $4.6 billion in 2014 to more than $5.9 billion in 2020. 
it's one of the biggest increases to their budget since Giuliani was in office. At a price tag of about $200 million a year, city council members voted to add 1,000 extra cops on the force in 2015. And despite grassroots activists' best efforts, the city moved to expand the department's reach and budget for years to come. That led to May 2020 when community leaders and activists called on city council to ensure that NYPD carries its fair share of budget cuts rather than making further cuts to the arts and recovery programs. However, Public Safety Committee Chair Donovan Richards responded by proposing a mere $50 million cut, less than 1% of the NYPD's budget. In comparison, this proposed budget cuts $827 million for the Department of Education. Great. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, so we've got a number of questions to ask you. I'll ask some, uh, but remember for those who are watching, please do put your questions uh, in the chat and I will do my best to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, so there's a couple things to respond to there. I mean, first of all, just the, probably the most basic one that a lot of people are thinking about when they hear about this demand to defund the police. Um, Obviously, a lot of people who are not already on the radical left, uh, when they hear a, a, a phrase like that, defund the police, their mind immediately goes to not having uh, the kind of safety uh, that the police supposedly provide for them in their communities. Uh, you write about this uh, in your book in terms of the kind of a contradictory uh, sense that on the one hand, people you know don't necessarily uh, trust the the police, or they, they you know they don't like police brutality, but they also do associate the police with some level of safety for their uh, communities. And you know, likewise, I think a lot of people are disgusted at seeing the kind of brutality that killed George Floyd, but they're maybe not ready to be uh, de you know, the average person demanding uh, defund the police. So how do you how do you see that kind of disjuncture, and how do we as the left overcome uh, that disjuncture? Right. So part of the problem here, right, is that for, for decades now, communities have been told that the only resource they can have to address their community problems is more policing and more incarceration. And so communities that have very real crime and public safety problems, they're desperate for help. And if the only thing on offer is policing, they'll ask for policing. Our job, I think, is to lay out what the alternatives would look like and also to give people a sense that they have the power to ask for what they really want. Because a lot of people in these communities know that they would be better served by a new youth center with mentoring services and maybe an anti-violence program of some time, some type included there, but they're told they can never have those things. So it we understand that people have insecurities and we have to overcome this idea that the only possible way to address them is policing. And we can do that in very specific targeted ways. So what I often recommend when I travel around the country talking to community organizations is that we should start with a kind of community needs assessment, which is what are the, those public safety challenges that you're facing? that have been turned over to the police to manage. And once we've identified those, we can start to think about what the alternatives might look like. We can bring in some outside experts. We can talk to people in the community who've been trying to do positive work outside the criminal justice system. And then we've got a demand from our local elected officials that they actually provide those things instead of more policing. To the extent that local governments can provide us with those things, that's a victory. And to the extent that they don't, it begs the question, why not? What is it about this system that we live under that it's unwilling and unable to meet the most basic human needs in our society? And that then can lead to a deeper kind of analysis and a broader kind of political vision, I think. Yeah, I mean, related to that, can you just spell out uh, you know, a bigger picture than just the need to defund the police department. What is the role of the police under capitalism? I mean, right. the kind of people that I was just referring to probably associated with, you know, the people who you call when you have an emergency, uh, but you write in the book that their function is uh, quite different, right? Right. Well, we've all grown up 
on these television shows, right, in which the police are superheroes. They solve every problem. They catch the bad guys. They chase the bank robbers. They find the serial killers. You know, but this is all a big myth. This is not what police actually do. They are not out chasing bank robbers and finding serial killers. The vast majority of police officers make like one felony arrest a year, a year. If they make two, they're cop of the month. What they're doing is they're managing the symptoms of a system of exploitation. And that's always been at the heart of American policing and policing internationally. In the book, I lay out the ways in which the origins of policing across the world, which happens primarily in the early 19th century, occurs in direct relationship to the three primary systems of economic exploitation during that time period. And these are colonialism, slavery, and the rise of industrialization. And policing develops to make those regimes of accumulation and exploitation possible. So we talk about the London Metropolitan Police as being the first modern police force. And we say, oh, this is great, the policing by consent, it's, it's a, a, a progressive alternative to using the militia. But the model for the London Metropolitan Police was developed by Sir Robert Peel, Robert, Bob, the Bobbies. But what no one talks about is what his job was before he comes up with the, poli the London Metropolitan Police. Well, he was in charge of the English occupation of Ireland. And he develops the Irish Peace Preservation Force as a paramilitary alternative to using the British Army, which at that time was tied up with Napoleon. And he uses that as a kind of proto-police force, embedding them in local communities so that they can preemptively put down what they called agricultural outrages, which were really peasant uprisings against British landlords starving them to death. He comes, Peel goes back to London just as the city is being flooded with folks from the countryside who've been displaced by the enclosures and searching for jobs in the new industrial sector. And he uses police to help shape that population into a stable, compliant working class. He breaks their unions, he raids their beer halls, he hassles them on the street over boisterous and disorderly behavior to fashion a new working class. In the U.S., we had our own colonial police forces like the Texas Rangers. We had even earlier forms of policing like the Charleston City Watch and Guard in Charleston, South Carolina, whose primary job in the late 1700s was the management of a, ma of a mobile slave population. So the history of American policing is always about this interchange of these three, the, at least the origins of these three systems. Now, today, we're not dealing with slavery and colonialism in quite the same way. And frankly, we barely have industrialization in the United States. What we have is this kind of neoliberal capitalism and austerity politics. And that system is producing massive wealth inequalities and the hollowing out of the welfare state that's producing mass homelessness, mass untreated mental illness, mass problematic relationships with drugs, black markets and drugs and sex work and stolen goods that people have turned to to survive in this precarious economy. And policing has come in to manage those suspect populations, really in their mind, surplus populations. They're not trying to form them into a working class. They're warehousing them in our prisons and jails. And so we have to understand policing as fundamentally a tool of social control to facilitate our exploitation. So the idea that we're going to make them nicer and friendlier while they do this task and that that's going to make everything okay is laughable. Right. And if that's their systemic role, then even the first place that many people go to in their minds when they see something like this is like, well, oh, well, we should have, you know, more black police officers policing black neighborhoods or, or police officers from the communities that they're supposed to be patrolling. 
uh, if, if their systemic function is to serve as, as this kind of a control of a, of a labor force or, an, or a non-laboring force, uh, then, no, yeah, like you said, no amount of, uh, no amount of community control, you know, the, the community control would have to mean overturning this whole system that the, the police exists to, uh, to be, uh, to, to be policing. Um, so that that would seem to then lead to the conversation of like, no, we can't just like have them doing the same stuff with the same amount of resources, but do it a little more nicely. We need to take away their power uh, to do it at all. We need less of them. We need them doing less of the stuff that they do. We need them doing it with, you know, uh, with fewer big guns and, and, and weapons of all kind. I mean, the, the only solution is to actually like cut their power and cut their resources. I think that's right. I think that's right. That that this this is just no true progressive movement can flourish in a police state. And basically, we have the kind of makings of that here, right? Where the police are injected into every part of people's lives. And of course, Trump wants to just make that problem worse, but it's really a bipartisan problem, you know. Democratic mayors have fully embraced this program. And so there is a deep political crisis here that's that's going to have to be resolved for us to make progress on this. Yeah, and and speaking of Democratic mayors, your video is mentioning the NYPD and Bill de Blasio. And as someone who doesn't live in New York but observes it from outside, it is very bizarre that Bill de Blasio endorsed Bernie Sanders, right? He likes to position himself as a progressive, although we know he's failed on many levels. But especially on policing, it seems like he is still, uh, despite, you know, the former Sandinista and the, the Bernie Bush and all the rest of it, he still seems like, uh, it, it seems like the NYPD that really has the control when it comes to public poli uh, public safety uh, over, over, or over the question of public safety, rather than de Blasio himself, he kind of has to grovel. And even though he's kind of uh, eating shit uh, all the time with them, there's still this uh, incredible level of rage that's directed from the NYPD at both the rank and file level and sometimes at the leadership level. Uh, can you just maybe talk about the NYPD as that kind of, of, a, of a case study? Am, or, am I right to, to sense that that is the relationship that, that, that de Blasio has to the police in New York? Well, I, I mean, I don't want to overstate this idea that like they're pulling his strings because that in a way lets him off the hook. He could do something about this if he wanted to, and I don't think he really wants to. He has capitulated to a certain kind of reactionary politics, this idea that there is no alternative, that, that he's stuck, and that really I think what it comes down to is that he is so afraid of disorder. He thinks that any uptick in crime or disorder will unleash reactionary forces and will bring back somebody like Giuliani. And in a way, that's not a crazy idea because Giuliani was brought to office on the wave of the failures of Koch and Dinkins to get a handle on disorder, the subject of my first book that you held up earlier. Uh, but what's lacking here is a crisis, what's at work here is a crisis of imagination. He's, a, he's accepted this idea that the only way to control disorder and crime is to turn the problem over to the police. And once he made that decision, all is lost. Because then he's enabling not just a loss of funds to the police department and the creation of a repressive apparatus, he's investing in an ideology, this thin blue line ideology that says that the only thing holding society together is the punitive and coercive interventions of policing. And once that ideology is in place, it's impossible to then say, but we also need social programs and these other things, because that ideology dismisses the usefulness of those interventions. So by doubling down on support for the police, he's undermined the possibility of any real progressive alternatives. I don't think there is a progressive vision that isn't rooted in defunding the police. Yeah, you're sounds like you're discuss, discussing a kind of like a domestic version of what people talked about Johnson trying to do in the 60s, a kind of guns and butter uh, approach to some social democratic welfare programs at home, but brutal imperialism abroad. And obviously that ended up 
not working out too well, despite some gains like the Great Society, but ultimately it was untenable. Well, this is uh, this is actually a, a big part of my buddy Stuart Trader's book, Badges Without Borders, which is here in this stack somewhere. Um, where he actually goes into the Vietnam War foreign policy strategies and shows how the direct connection between the development of counterinsurgency technologies and ideologies in Vietnam are occurring in American policing. That it's a two-way dialogue that's constantly going on and that they're driven by the same kinds of considerations, which are that these are dangerous populations that cannot be trusted to govern themselves, that we have to come in and shape them in such a way that capitalism can make life better for everyone, right? That's their worldview. And uh, Julian Goh, the sociologist, uh, had a piece that just came out that shows that the development of militarization of policing in the US in the turn of the previous century is directly tied to things like the US intervention in the Philippines, and that there's this kind of homology, this similarity in which police forces in the United States view immigrants and African Americans as a colonized population to be controlled by the police, and that the most problematic departments are those with the largest, most demonized suspect populations. Yeah, yeah, you glad you brought up Stuart Schrader. Uh, we did an interview with him in Jacobin by John Walters uh, about his book, and that was where I was going to ask you next before we turn it over to the questions from the audience, which, by the way, I have a ton of great questions. I'm going to do my best to ask as many of them as possible. But, yeah, please do keep them coming both on Facebook and YouTube, and I'm going to try to my best to synthesize as many of them as possible and ask Alex them as many as, uh, as, many as possible. Uh, but yeah, my, my last question was going to be about the ties with imperialism that you started getting into there. I mean, uh, the most obvious is that uh, I think it was Stuart in that interview in Jacobin who talks about the literal transference of military grade weaponry being given to police departments all around the country. And that's not going to be a surprise to anybody who has been out on the streets in any of these protests. I mean, they're, they're getting, they're, 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 it's almost like the police are like the younger brother, like getting the hand-me-downs from the American uh, imperialist uh, machine. Uh, and, you know, if you are on the streets of a major city and you're hearing flashbangs and you're getting shot out of rubber bullets, I mean, it feels like a war zone as you're out there, which is obviously what the, uh, the vibe that the uh, police departments all around the country are trying to, trying to create. So, yeah, um, can you just talk a little bit more about that, that tie uh, between uh, imperialist strategy. I mean, you write in the book, for example, about the ties between counterinsurgency strategy that w that were deployed in places like Vietnam and later Iraq, and how that's also becoming the strategy of a lot of urban police forces. So talk about that tie. Sure. So, well, historically, uh, there's an example in the book about the formation of the first state police force, which is the Pennsylvania State Police, which was formed about 120 years ago. There were a whole series of uprisings in the coal and iron fields in Pennsylvania during that time. This is, you know, the early period of industrial unionization. And the coal miner, the coal owners, the coal field owners and the iron uh, factory owners, they, they couldn't get a handle on this and they tried to enlist local police. But the local police were either unable or unwilling to control the strike activity. So they went to the governor. And the governor said, well, I got this idea. Let's create a kind of semi-private state police force called, called the Coal and Iron Police, which was basically the coal and iron companies could hire anyone they wanted and pay a $1 a piece fee to the state government, and they would get a state badge called the Coal and Iron Police. And they went out and did massacres, and it was horrible. So the governor said, no, 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 we can't do this. We're going to create a, a modern professional state police force. And what was his model? The U.S. occupation forces in the Philippines. He actually imported personnel and technology directly from the Philippines to develop a set of counterinsurgency strategies to put down the strikes, ideally with less violence and killing to create more legitimacy for this undertaking. The workers called them the Pennsylvania Cossacks. And this is what, you know, this has been the history of American policing, this back and forth exchange. 
So today we've got police that look more and more like the military and a military that looks more and more like a police force in a lot of ways, right? So much of the policing in places like Afghanistan and Iraq is about holding urban space and really has a policing-like function. And we hear sometimes, ironically, from returning veterans who see what's going on in the United States, they're like, uh, when we were in the army, we would never have been allowed to use force like that or under those circumstances. Our rules of engagement were much tighter than American police uh, rely on. So it's true that we've seen this militarization of hardware and, and not just the direct transfer, but also the purchasing of the hardware through federal grants, through Homeland Security grants and the COPS office. And part of this has been to stimulate a new domestic market for military producers. So it's not just casting off the waste, it's creating new demand. But it's also about the expansion of a whole military esprit de corps, warrior style training, the increase in the number of paramilitary units, and the way that has shaped the functioning of gang units and gun interdiction units and narcotics units who see themselves as Rambos out there, you know, banging down doors and, and crashing people uh, into walls and stuff like that. So this, is, this has always been an interchange. And, you know, anyone who thinks that implicit bias training is going to fix that is just, you know, they're fooling themselves. So we have a question from John Capobano. Uh, can we scale down policing without simultaneously scaling down the overall power of capital? And I guess what that question is getting at is, how, I assume we can't just have a, a movement that fights to reduce police budgets without also being able to scale up a social welfare state to build the power of the labor movement and, and build the power of social movements that can make other progressive demands in society. Um, so can you talk about that, uh, that what that that uh, the, the movements uh, that is demanding a defunding of police budget, what that relationship is to a broader attempt to scale back the power of capital. Great. So I want to be really clear about this. I, I've never argued that all our political energy should go into a campaign to dial back the police. I think that would be a mistake because we need to build in our communities. We need to build in our workplaces. But on the other hand, too many of our movements, our single issue movements, our labor movement, have given police a pass, haven't made the connection to the ways in which our over-reliance on policing creates this ideological logic that undermines our ability to be successful in these other movements, not to mention the direct repression of our movements that comes from that policing apparatus. So I'm trying to engage in a kind of corrective here, if you will, to say that it's not enough to talk about economic justice or even racial justice in the abstract. We have to understand the way in which our over-reliance on policing undermines all the rest of those movements so that unions should not be making partnerships with police. And our single issue movements and other movements should not be ignoring the criminal justice system. We have to integrate that analysis into all the work that we do and see those connections. And frankly, if we have any hope of building a multiracial workers movement, criminal justice reform has to be a central plank of that because for young people of color, that is how they experience the state, sometimes more than from a boss. We have a question from a number of people uh, that is related to what you were, where you were just going with that about the, the role of the labor movement. Several questions about police reforms. One from uh, my, my good friend and Jacobin contributor, Rachel Johnson. How should the movement for defunding the police confront the entrenched power of police unions who stand in the way of even the most basic reforms? And then related to that, somebody else asked about how we talk about police unions without, uh, or, or not without, but uh, how, how in talking about what their role is in preventing progressive uh, change from happening in criminal justice, we are often accused of being anti-union. Uh, so could you respond to those two things, just the, the general question of how we engage 
with the question of police unions and how what's the response to some of these as well if you po oppose police unions you're being anti-union right so uh, just so people know about my background, I, I'm a fourth generation unionist. The Vitalis were coal miners in Southern Illinois. Um, I just finished a long stretch on the executive committee of the Professional Staff Congress, the CUNY Faculty and Professional Staff Union, including six years as a, a vice president. So I consider myself a unionist and, and a part of the union movement. And in that sense, I, I don't think that we should take the position that police can't have unions. Workers are going to have unions, and we don't want to be in the business of undermining the right to unionization. However, we should tightly restrict, through our political activism, the ability of those unions to be political actors. And one of the ways to do that is to make their endorsements and campaign contributions toxic. And this is actually happening in New York. Over the last week, about six was the latest number I saw. Uh, elected officials in New York City have taken their past donations from police unions and written checks to mutual aid projects and bail funds with that money. And that is a sign of success for us. We need to out all those politicians who take that police union money. And we need to say that you can't be our friend if you're taking that money. And let me tell you, a lot of people taking that money try to say that they're our friends. Some of them are black and Latino. Some of them are working class. And we have to put a stop to that. In California, they've actually established a database that actually shows which politicians have taken money from which police and corrections unions. And we need to do more of that work around the country. We also need to intervene with mayors and city councils over collective bargaining agreements between the police and local cities. People say, oh, well, the, the police have these great you know, collective bargaining agreements as if they dream them up on their own. But of course, they're bargained with the city and the city gives this stuff away to them. So we need to hold those politicians accountable for the kinds of perks and the insulation from accountability that's often built into these union contracts. So it's not about busting the union. It's about limiting the scope of its power. We have a question from Corey Choo Choo. How do we uh, either shift the U.S. justice system or social consciousness to care less about blue collar crime and more about white collar crime, which may have more societal consequence? I think this has become kind of meme lately during these protests of people comparing decked out cops and tanks and full riot gear and shooting all kinds of crazy weapons versus the healthcare workers who don't have the kind of PPE that they need in order to be fighting the coronavirus. I think that probably partially answers the question. I mean, when people think of it that way, they're probably more likely uh, to care. Uh, they, they understand that when you, uh, when you give all of these uh, cops all of this money to buy all these toys, that uh, you don't get to buy things like a PPE for, uh, for healthcare workers. But what about like white collar crime and, and, and the kind of looting of the uh, executive class in, in the United States looting? Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Right. The, the, the looters arrested for, for looting Target forgot to incorporate as a private equity firm before they looted Target. Right. Because that's the way to get away with that. Uh, yes, we have to think we need to rethink fundamental notions of justice and accountability in our society so that we understand these things in relationship to questions of harm. So obviously, if someone you know, steals my bike or robs me, that's a harm to me, that's a real thing. And we need to do whatever we can to try to reduce those harms. But when a bank repossesses my house, redlines my community, steals my wages, that's also a harm. And that harm, is often inflicted simultaneously on millions of people. So the cumulative harms are so much great. Or when a chemical, a chemical company poisons the environment, that's also a harm. But the reason we think of these harms so differently is about a set of politics. Whenever politicians 
want to frame something as a crime problem, we need to be looking at what they're covering up, what they're enabling, because they're using that to serve a political project. Just like Nixon in the 1960s created the war on drugs, not because he gave a damn about drug overdoses. It was a strategy, a rancid racist strategy to bring historically white Southern Democrats into the Republican Party in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement. He said, if we can turn this drug thing into a big issue, that will allow us to criminalize African Americans, to demonize them, and to signal to whites that we are going to be the party of racial animus in America. So he creates all kinds of new federal crimes and sets out to prosecute them. So we need to have a complete rethink, not just of what's a crime and what's not a crime, and what's a harm and not what a harm, what's not a harm, but also how do we deal with these things? I don't think you know just finding an executive here or there and putting them in prison for polluting the environment is the way to fix this problem, because it's not systemic. It doesn't deal with the extent of corporate power. They just bring in a new CEO to do the same thing. We have to rein in corporate power systematically. We have to rein in the power of the banks, the power of the polluters, and that requires a much broader politics. But that's the politics we're going to have to have if we're going to make any progress on this. Question from Kale. Uh, what do we make of the observation that the new protest movements, uh, assumably the ones that have emerged in the last uh, week or so, and the ones that have popped off every time there's been a, a, a police killing like this that's caught on tape in the last few years, uh, those new movements haven't taken the majority of the politics of even a few months ago or the past few years, like the ones that we saw in the Sanders campaign that were putting forward all kinds of new social democratic demands. What could it take to shift the demands of these movements towards the expansion of social goods rather than uh, what we've been talking about uh, them often saying, which is, you know, uh, the, these po proposals like sensitivity training or, or whatever? Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not out in the streets around the country, and I think we have a lot to learn about what the sentiment is out there on the streets, but I, I have been watching what I can and looking at signs and talking to some people, and, you know, it's clear that these protests are not just about policing. In many of these cases, these are large multiracial gatherings of folks, and I think that those streets are filled with Bernie supporters people who are concerned about Medicare for all, uh, who are concerned about wages and working conditions, and that policing has just been the trigger to ignite this movement. You know, when, when we look back at the riots and uprisings of the 1960s, we don't talk about that today as just an issue of policing. You know, we understand that policing was often the trigger, but it was not what was really driving this rage and desire for change. And I think that's true today, that this is about the, the failure of political leadership of both political parties. It's about a kind of generational fear of, for the future, about the, the environment, economic inequality, the coming looming depression, et cetera. And just the sense that there is no one out there articulating a real way forward, not these big city mayors, certainly not Trump, but also not the uh, mainstream leadership of the Democratic Party. And so the streets become the only avenue to express this outrage. The question to me is, you know, will it be sustained and will it be ch channeled into more organized movements with specific demands so that we can start really building political power rather than just creating a climate of crisis, which is important, but not sufficient. You mentioned on a talk I heard you do earlier on Novara Media, I think, that you were advising the Bernie Sanders campaign about criminal justice, uh, his criminal justice platform. Obviously, uh, Bernie has suspended his campaign, and we're stuck with this guy who was a key architect of the mass incarceration regime that we live under. Um, so I doubt that uh, Joe Biden is going to become a champion of this defund the police uh, demand anytime <laughs> soon. But 
Uh, I wonder if you could talk about hopeful signs that you see maybe within this small but important new crop of democratic socialist uh, elected officials who have been elected both, you know, there's the national level people like AOC and, uh, and Rashida Tlaib, but also at the more local or state level, um, Julia Salazar in your state in the state Senate. Are there examples yeah. of people who are championing this kind of demand right now? So uh, the initial response at the national level was not good. And I, and I criticized it in the nation this week. Uh, even our allies, even Bernie Sanders, you know, said, well, we need more investigations. We, we don't need any more investigations, right? We, we don't need to, the cops have already been arrested and fired. You know, we don't need any more investigations. May, you know, these pattern and practice cases, you know, Obama once was, you know, on television this evening saying, you know, we need more of this kind of, that is not going to help. Th these investigations have been shown to be completely ineffective. But there is a deeper set of movements underway in Washington, and people like Ayanna Presley and others have put forward some pretty good documents that talk about dialing back support for criminalization. I think they need to come out more forcefully right now and say, we got to get rid of the cops office. We got to get rid of Operation Relentless Pursuit, which is flooding seven US cities with more federal agents and more funding for police. We got to repeal the FOSTA SESTA law that criminalizes sex work. You know, there's a lot of very immediate specific interventions that the Democrats in Congress could be supporting rather than calling for more investigations. But I think there is more hopefulness at the local level. And that's really where a lot of the struggle needs to happen, both in the sense that policing in particular is primarily a local matter, but also in the sense that we're not going to win this in an abstract national ideological campaign. We have to win this battle in specific communities around specific community needs. We have to convince people that we have a program that's going to make their lives safer, better, healthier, more secure. And we have a lot of local politicians, a lot of them associated with DSA, but not all of them. A uh, big fan of Julia Salazar, who, uh, with whom I get a chance to chat with every once in a while. She understands, as a lot of these other folks do, that public safety doesn't come at the end of a police handgun. It comes from building community infrastructures that build people up, that create stable families and, and, and prevent the theft of wages and homes from banks, right? It's not just about dealing with criminal offenses. It's about dealing with white collar offenses of harms. Um, just this uh, last week, just this week in the last couple of days, a group of, uh, I think the number is now over 40 candidates for city council in New York City signed a document pledging to campaign on a platform of cutting the NYPD budget by a billion dollars. So this is a sign of the kind of emergent politics that we're seeing in New York and frankly in many other parts of the country. There are active campaigns underway in dozens of cities across the United States to defund the police. And it's those kinds of movements that have to become part of our overall political repertoire. Uh, we're getting to the end here. Just have a couple minutes left. Uh, we have a lot of comments about people curious about what's in that book stack behind you. So you, uh, <laughs> your strategic placement so, got people curious. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a YouTube channel called The Critical Criminologist, which you can just Google me. And most of these are books of people that I've interviewed uh, or will be interviewing in the future. So you can check that out, though. They're kind of the inside baseball interviews a little bit uh, directed at, at, at criminologists and academics. But it's a good preview of I, what I think are some really amazing books out there. And one interview coming up, I'll just take this right off the top. Another great verso book, Policing a Field Guide by David Correa and Tyler Wall. So, uh, yeah, definitely check that out. Uh, David Campbell asks how we can create grassroots institutions that can defend public safety in a way that's fundamentally different from the institution of the police. I guess he's getting out like what is a concrete example of if we successfully defund the police and well, we've got this money to do something else with what, what are we creating to serve that function of actually uh, uh, strengthening public safety in a real way, not through the expansion of the police. 
Yeah, it's not one thing. It's a whole diversity of things. It's about creating like a mental health infrastructure, which doesn't just mean turning it over to the state and nonprofits. I mean, we need to create space for peer-to-peer -peer mental health services. Uh, and some of the best proposals are very clear about this. Or we have state-funded centers, but they're using a medical model that is embedded in specific community needs where the community is part of the process. Um, so it looks like community-based anti-violence centers that can help address problems of domestic violence, of youth violence, of disputes between people in the community. These could be government functions. They could be nonprofit functions. They, they could be some kind of hybrid. You know, wh whenever we can do things on a community basis without direct state control, you know, I'm for trying to do that. But I think we also need state institutions. We just need to have control over them as much as possible. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I've been going through this ritual every night over the last couple nights where around 10 or 11 o'clock central time when I live in Chicago, I start scrolling through Twitter. And at that time of night, basically since Friday or Thursday, everything is just the most horrifying police violence you can possibly think of. I mean, just, yeah. you know, each, each city has some new level of barbarism that I find hard to believe that human beings are choosing to engage in. Uh, and so for the last couple of nights, I've just been horrified, just like endlessly scrolling through all of these horrible images. Uh, but then yesterday I went out to a protest that was in the early evening in Chicago and it was in downtown Chicago that uh, marched north to the north side of the city, which is a kind of wealthier and whiter part of the city. And to get there, I had to pass by uh, army Humvees that were deployed by the governor of the state of Illinois, a Democratic governor, uh, J.D. Pritzker. And, you know, there's actual soldiers in fatigues uh, there in the streets. And all of these very average people with, you know, cardboard signs that they had scrolled, uh, you know, slogans on and Sharpie were walking past these soldiers, obviously knowing that the soldiers could, at the drop of a hat, mow them all down and end their lives. Yet these people were still choosing to, uh, for the umpteenth day in a row, come out in downtown Chicago, take great risk themselves. They've seen those videos too. They've probably experienced that kind of a uh, brutal crackdown from the cops and from the soldiers uh, that, that everybody else sees in those videos. And yet they were still coming out again to make these uh, these demands. Uh, and to me, that was a really uh, hopeful thing to experience because it seemed to indicate that no matter what the level of police militarization, no matter the fact that there were actual soldiers in fatigues on the streets, there, I was in one march that was just one of several marches that were happening in, in the different parts of the city at that time that was still showing up and, and, and people were just refusing to be cowed. Uh, so to me, that was an incredible uh, testament to the kind of resiliency of, the, of people who are coming out to these protests and also uh, a reminder that no matter how big the guns are that these uh, cops are, are outfitted with and no matter what kind of insane new brutal toys that they have, uh, they are basically unable to stop what is turning into a mass movement with mass numbers of people's, people in the streets who are uh, refusing uh, to go away and refusing to let this get uh, swept under the rug. So it's a, a kind of a note of uh, optimism at a time when a lot of things are pretty bleak. I agree. I agree. It's very, and you left out also the, the risks of with COVID that you would think would keep people at home and people are ready to fight. And we, again, I think we have to understand this as a generational dynamic, that there, there's something going on, that people are not going to put up with this. And if Trump tries to further militarize the situation, I think that will just make the protest dramatically larger. And I think that's the, the, even the threat of that is making the protest larger. Well, this is why we believe in mass politics, right? Because when you are in the streets with mass numbers of people and doing organizing on the mass level, uh, no amount of uh, repression will stop uh, people who are out together in, in enormous numbers. It can't be stopped. So uh, we thank you to Alex for coming on. Uh, please do remember 
uh, to like and subscribe uh, to Jacobin. Again, Alex's book, The End of Policing, is free on the Verso Books website, versobooks.com. It's an excellent book, and uh, you know it is what is it about two hundred fifty pages? It's the length that God intended all books to be. In my opinion, three hundred. <laughs> and Verso is too much. Yeah. And Verso's asking, in lieu of paying for the download, if they could contribute to one of these social movements that is out on the streets, uh, we'd really appreciate that. There have been seventy five thousand downloads in the last four days. Wow, incredible! And well, and there actually there are no printed books left. Oh, well, oh, so I've there's, got there's a few. Yeah, there's they, they, they just emailed me. They got a few in the office. You know, that's about it. All right. Well, do go to their website. Uh, do download it. And as, as I've mentioned before, please do like and share uh, this conversation. And thanks again to Alex and thanks to Kale Brooks for producing it. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Oh, 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 oh,